Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cato Institute. Uh, it's great to see so many uh, young families here, especially. Uh, my name is Chelsea Follett. I'm a policy analyst here at Cato in the Center for Global Liberty and Prosperity and managing editor of Human Progress. Dot org, a web project uh, that encourages a cool-headed, data-based view of the state of the world, a goal very much in line with the book we are discussing today. I am delighted to host this forum uh, for economist Emily Oster. Her new work is entitled Crib Sheets, A Data-Driven Guide to Better, More Relaxed Parenting from Birth to Preschool. Uh, every new parent is bombarded with fear-mongering regarding decisions such as whether to work or stay home, whether to sleep train, whether to breastfeed or formula feed. Uh, and yet many widely held views and even official government recommendations uh, regarding these decisions for parents are not backed up by evidence. To give one example from Emily's book, the official recommendation in the US that children sleep in a crib in their parents' room for a full year is based on three studies, none of which actually suggest that's any safer than sleeping in a crib in a separate room with a baby monitor. Uh, to give another example, the CDC states it is committed to increasing uh, breastfeeding rates throughout the United States. While I myself am a nursing mother, I do question whether we should really be putting so much pressure uh, and emphasis on trying to uh, increase rates of one feeding method over another instead of letting each family make those decisions for themselves. Uh, in Crib Sheet, Emily cuts through this alarmist rhetoric and the fear-mongering around modern-day parenting with a calm and comprehensive look at the data. But importantly, she states there is no single optimal set of child-rearing decisions. Rather, she shows how thinking like an economist uh, can help parents to evaluate the available choices for themselves and make the decisions that are right for them. Instead of promoting a one-size-fits-all approach to parenting, Emily presents parents with the evidence and an approach to evaluate it so that they can make the decisions that are best for their families. Two reasonable people can look at the exact same data and come to different decisions. Emily holds a PhD from Harvard University and currently serves as a professor of economics at Brown University. Her previous book, Expecting Better, Why the Conventional Pregnancy Wisdom is Wrong and What You Really Need to Know, has sold over 100,000 copies and has been referred to by Time Magazine as the Modern Pregnancy Bible. As she discusses in Crib Sheet, she is also the mother of two young children, you can follow her on Twitter at Prof. Emily Oster. To comment on Emily's work and join us for the broader discussion, I'm also delighted to welcome Julie Gunlock. Julie is the director of the Independent Women's Forum's Center for Progress and Innovation and the author of the book, From Cupcakes to Chemicals, How the Culture of Alarmism Makes Us Afraid of Everything and How to Fight Back, which encourages parents to have some perspective and resist fear-mongering. Her writing has appeared in the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, Forbes, US News and World Report, and many other outlets. Relevant to today's discussion, she is also the mother of three children. You can follow her on Twitter at jgunlock. Emily will discuss Crib Sheet for uh, 20 to 25 minutes, then Emily will comment for another 10 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have as much time as we can for questions from you all in the audience. Uh, you can join the conversation on Twitter using hashtag econparenting, as in economics, that's hashtag econparenting. I do ask that you please silence uh, your phones for this talk. Uh, so welcome to Cato again, and I hope you enjoy today's event. Okay, so thank you all for coming, and thank you so much, Chelsea, for, for organizing. Um, so I want you to, to picture this. Uh, you have a three-week-old. It's 3 o'clock in the morning. 
Uh, you're sitting in bed and your baby is falling asleep eating, you know, they're, they're there. And, and you kind of know if you just sort of edge down a little bit and kind of put them next to you, they'll stay asleep and then they'll sleep and you'll sleep and everybody will feel much better in, in the morning. Uh, but of course you're, you're conflicted, there's this bassinet next to you, you're fairly sure that you're supposed to put them in, in the bassinet. Uh, but you know if you do that, there is a very good chance that, you, uh, that, they, will, that they will wake up. So what do you do? Um, well, your partner, this is entirely their fault. It was their idea, and you'll discuss it with them later. They're snoring uh, next to you, so they're not available for discussion. Uh, and so maybe you take out your, your phone, uh, and you get onto Facebook, and you say, hey, does anybody have any thoughts on, on co-sleep? People have thoughts, many thoughts, uh, and you get a lot of conflicting views. On the one hand, you have the people who are like, absolutely, not only is it fine to do that, you should do that, because that is the way people have been sleeping for millions of years, and if you don't do that, your baby will probably not be attached to you, and they may never love you. Also, they might not love anyone else. Then there are the other people who are like, if you do this, your baby will die for sure. Okay, that also... Okay, so those both seem very, uh, very extreme. Question is, you know, within those conflicting views, uh, how are you going to make a, a decision? And so a lot of people ask me, like, when I think about parenting, I don't necessarily start about thinking about economics. Uh, you know, why is economics the right starting point for, for a parenting book? But I think this kind of conflict is kind of precisely the reason, uh, the reason why. Because economics is really a science about decision making and about making decisions uh, based on data as opposed to some other ways you could make decisions like just at random or on a whim or what last person you talked to, uh, talk to told you. Um, so when you think about this kind of decision, you know, should you co-sleep or, or not, uh, how should you make the decision? And I'm really going to argue in the book that you should think about the data, you should confront the data, you should confront the actual risks, and you should think about them in the context of other risks that you may be taking, that these risks are not, uh, they're not unique and they are not there is not an extreme, neither of these extreme views that are being espoused in these Facebook groups, neither of them is, is right or is, the, is exactly right. And that, uh, that two different people, as Chelsea said, sort of two different people are gonna look at the same data and maybe not come to the same conclusions. And I think once you take that kind of confronting approach and really think about the data, you can make the decision that works for your, for your family and I think when you do this, this is sort of the key insight, is that that isn't going to be the same decision that is going to work for other, uh, for other people. And I think that's really where the subtitle of the book, More Relaxed Parenting, uh, comes in, that part of what is, seems so stressful about modern parenting, I think for many of us, is the feeling like somehow we are doing it wrong because we are doing it differently from other people. And the constant second guessing that comes with that, uh, with, with that is, is itself anxiety provoking. And I think recognizing that, you know, I've made the choice that works, that works for me. It won't be the same choice as, as everyone else, that that in and of itself can be a relaxing, uh, can be, can be a relaxing thing. So I don't want to talk for too long today because I want to leave a bunch of time uh, for, for Julie and then for, and then for questions. Um, but I wanted to give you a bit of a sense of kind of the work that I try to do in the book around getting through some of the data and helping people think about what data is, is good and what data is, uh, is, is less good. Um, so I want to talk just through, through one example, um, which is a, a single, uh, which is the, the topic of breastfeeding, and in particular the question of breast milk, is it magic? Uh, so certainly, uh, if, you, uh, if you have been parenting in the modern era, you will not be surprised to hear the claim breast milk is, uh, is magic. The pressure to breastfeed starts very early. It happens a lot. You get it before you have a baby. It happens in the hospital. Uh, afterwards, you know, if you breastfeed in public, some people will tell you, you know, put that away. But then other people will stop you and they'll say, oh, it's so great that you're doing this for your baby. Like, that's so, so great. Good job. The best. <laughs> The best start. So good. Uh, so good. And so, of course, this is like the, the pressure that people get for this, I think, is made much more salient by the fact that it can be very hard. Uh, so, you know, breastfeeding is not, so, for some people, it's, it's great. You just pop it on, the baby is, that's great. Uh, but for some of us, this is a really challenging thing. The baby doesn't latch. They don't like to breastfeed. They want to do something else. It hurts. Your nipples are bleeding. You know, this isn't like have a cookie. It, this is hard. 
Uh, so, you know, that's a very hard thing. And people are telling you, you know, you have to keep doing it because that's the most important thing for your, uh, for your, for your baby. And I think it can be very frustrating and, and, and defeating uh, for, for many women. So just to be a little bit more concrete about, like, what are people being told, um, I pulled this list of benefits of breastfeeding from some different websites. Um, and it was too long for just single lists, so we get a categorical, uh, categorical list. So some short-term benefits for the baby in terms of, uh, of, of health in a wide range of ways, some long-term benefits for the baby in terms of, for the kid in terms of health, less diabetes, less arthritis, less cancer, meningitis, pneumonia, urinary tract infections, Crohn's disease, obesity, allergies. Of course, they will be smarter, higher IQ, but don't forget about yourself. There's a lot of benefits for you, free birth control. You'll be very thin. Your baby will love you more. You're gonna be very rich. Uh, no stress, <laughs> sleeping all the time, better friendships, that's very important to a lot of us, um, and so on and so on. And then in the final column, of course, we have the, uh, the methane production um, from cows. Cows produce methane. Um, so really, there are many reasons to, to breastfeed. Uh, and I don't have time to go through all of these in this talk, but I just want to pull out one and talk a little bit about how we would think about evidence for the claim that breastfeeding raises, uh, raises your, kid's, uh, your kid's IQ. So, this actually comes up, this claim comes up all the time, the idea that breast milk uh, will make your kid uh, smarter. And to, to get a sense of kind of why you might think that, let's just like start with a particular uh, e example. So, um, so this is a study of like 350 Scandinavian kids from the 19 studies, the data is from the 1980s. Um, what they do in this study is they compare the IQ scores for these kids at the age of five, comparing between kids who are breastfed uh, and kids who are, uh, and kids who are not. Uh, and in because it's Scandinavia, everybody is breastfed, so the comparison is kids who are breastfed for more than six months versus less than three months. And uh, what they find is that the kids who are breastfed longer have higher IQ scores, actually quite a lot higher. It's about five, five IQ points, um, or sorry, eight IQ points, uh, which is, like, that is a lot of, I, that's a, a lot of points. Um, and this is actually a pretty standard kind of result. So there's many, many data sets from many different places where if you look at them, you can see that uh, kids who are breastfed have higher IQs than kids, who are, than kids who are not. But if you dig a little bit more into this study or kind of any of the studies on this, uh, what you'll see is that, is that the moms who breastfeed are also different um, from those who, uh, those who don't. They tend to be more educated. They tend to be richer. They tend to be sort of positively selected in other ways. Um, it's kind of, there's a sort of interesting side question about like why are there these gradients with, uh, with education? Um, so actually those emerge in the, set, at least in the US in the 1970s. So, so uh, breastfeeding reached its kind of lowest point in the early 70s and then it, it goes up from the early 70s to the, to the present and those increases are much larger among uh, more educated uh, women, um, which is something I think we don't have a great understanding about, but the result is that in the sort of current, uh, in the current period, this selection is very much in favor of, of kind of women with higher socioeconomic status breastfeeding more. So to go back to this study, so, uh, so the researchers actually in this example, the Scandinavian data, they actually see some features of the mom. That's how they know they're different. So they see their education, they see some things about their, about their income. Uh, and they can, they can do what we call adjust for them, so they can run their, their regressions, run their analyses, controlling for differences in, in education or income to the extent that they, that they see them. Uh, and what they find is that when they put in those controls, when they kind of try to hold constant education or income, their effects are smaller, but they're still there. So they find these sort of much smaller, uh, much smaller differences in, in IQ, uh, but still what we call statistically, statistically significant. Um, so you might say, okay, great. Well, that sounds like we're uh, like we're done. Um, so I con you control for things. That seems that seems good. You adjust for these differences. So probably these effects are are real. But I think the worry, uh, and this is, comes up all the time, is that those controls may be incomplete, right? So I see like whether the mom went to high school or not, but I don't see everything about her uh, background, everything about her education, everything about other features of her, and if those other features are also related to their kid's IQ and to, and to breastfeeding, we may not be like done adjusting for these differences. So we want to ask the question often, you know, if I control a little bit, if I adjust for some differences, the effect gets smaller, how much, more, how much smaller would it get if I could adjust for everything? Um, so to see this, we can actually look at another, another study, so I want to put up a little bit of, of data. So this study uses a much larger sample. It has about 5,500 kids run in the US. 
Um, and the, the data set this is, this is drawn from has the same features as this Scandinavian data. So I see kids, I see some measure of their test scores, I see whether they're breastfed or not. But I also see two other things. One is I see an IQ test for mom. So now I can see not only the mom's education and, and her income and whether she's married, but I can also actually see her measured IQ. I can also see multiple kids in the same household. So I see like some moms who have two or three, uh, who are three kids, and in some cases, one of those kids was breastfed and one of those kids was, was not. Uh, so we can do a, a larger range of analyses in these data. So we can start with, uh, with what I'd refer to as the naive comparison. So just comparing kids who are breastfed to kids who are not and looking at differences in their IQ scores. Uh, and in this data set, the difference in IQ score is about 4.6 points on this particular test. So that's actually very big. Uh, that's a very big, uh, very big effect. It's highly statistically significant. So then we can do what they do in the Scandinavian study as well. We can adjust for demographics. So we can adjust for differences in education and, and income across moms. Uh, and what we find is a much smaller effect, but still actually pretty sizable and significant. So this is about one point four IQ points, which, you know, is not, maybe you wouldn't look at this and be like, wow, I'm going to change my whole life for that. But that's a, that's a, that's the kind of effect that gets people's, that gets people's attention. Then we can add a third control. We can say, okay, now let's adjust for the mom's IQ. So now let's go beyond just the demographics and put in the control for IQ. And now we see the effect, well, actually in some specifications still significant, is getting much smaller. It's about a half an IQ point. Okay, but it's still there. And so maybe if you're, if you're a person whose goal is to kind of like spend all of your time investing in every possible IQ point your kid can have, maybe you'd still, be, uh, you'd still be, be compelled here. But then we can take our last step and we can actually adjust for the, what family you're in. So we can actually say, let's compare two kids, same mom, one of them's breastfed and one of them is, uh, is not. Uh, and then you see this number here. It's all the way teeny, you barely see it. It's 0.02. IQ points, okay? So almost, and it's certainly not statistically different from zero. So almost nobody is, do, you, you're not doing things for 0.02 IQ points, okay? That's not an important number. Um, so why is this analysis useful? So I think it tells us sort of two things. First, it tells us like, th th there is no effect of breastfeeding on IQ. And this is, this is echoed in other data like this and in other kinds of, of sort of well-controlled studies that we just simply, the best data does not support an effect of breastfeeding on, on IQ. But I think what's important here is it also gives us a sense of why some of these other studies do show us an effect, right? So one argument you could have is, well, look, you have two studies. One says an effect, one says no effect. How do I know which one to believe? This study says there's an effect if you do it in the same way as these other studies. It's only because they are able to do better at adjusting for differences across moms that they are able to get to, to zero. So I think this tells us a little bit about why uh, some of these other studies are, are, uh, are flawed in this, in this particular way. Um, so, uh, so I argue in the book that this study is representative of a, of a bigger literature uh, on this particular question. And, and in the end, uh, that there are a bunch of other uh, links with, between breastfeeding and various outcomes, which sort of you can do the same kind of analysis uh, too. Uh, and so in the end, I put up a sort of updated uh, version of this, uh, of this table, uh, which says that actually, to be clear, there are some benefits of breastfeeding, some things that are definitely supported in the best data. Many of them surround uh, some early life health. So babies who are infants who are breastfed um, seem to have fewer allergic, uh, allergic rashes, fewer gastrointestinal disorders. Um, there are some strong benefits to, to preterm babies um, and maybe some benefits for ear infections. Actually, it does seem like there are some long-term benefits for mom in terms of breast cancer reduction. Um, and it is mechanically true that cows uh, produce methane. Um, so those, that's true. But like relative to the sort of picture that you get from the first graph, this is just much more limited. And so when we tell people things like breast is best, that's, that's true in the sense that it's, it's, it's best, uh, in the sense that it has some benefits. Uh, and so I guess if that's what you mean by best, then it is, it is best. Um, but I think it's not best in the way that that's said. Like it's best and it's best, the most important thing you could possibly do. And if you don't do it, you have failed as a parent. And I think that this, this picture gives a, a, a different, 
a more nuanced, perhaps, approach to how we might convince, like, talk to people about the about the benefits of breastfeeding. It doesn't mean that people shouldn't breastfeed, uh, but I think, and I, I think it really doesn't mean that they shouldn't be helped if they if they want to. But I think it also means we should be careful about some of the rhetoric we have around the importance of this in in parenting. Um, so the book actually goes through much more than uh, than, than breastfeeding. So I'd spend time talking about um, co-sleeping and about potty training, about the choice to have a parent stay at home versus uh, versus work out outside the home. Um, and I think in a lot of these cases, if you look out at the way people talk about parenting in the world, you would be sort of forgiven for thinking that there is a right choice, uh, and that you just have to look out and find like what's the right. Uh, what's the right choice? Um, but I think, in, in fact, in almost all of these cases, the data is more um, is more nuanced. So if you think about something like co-sleeping, where I, I started this uh, this discussion, uh, I there are uh, there are some ways to co-sleep that are safer than others, and so there's clearly some messages that should be sent around. If you are going to co-sleep, you should not smoke or drink or sleep with a lot of covers. That there are safer and less safe ways to do this. Uh, it is also the case that. Even if you do it as safely as possible, there are some risks to co-sleeping, uh, but they are small. Uh, they are small in comparison to, say, the kinds of risks people are taking getting in, getting in cars. Uh, so that means that some people are going to look at that data and say, you know, there's absolutely no way I would take this kind of risk. This isn't something that, I, that I'm going to do. And there are some people who will look and say, yes, I see that, but this is the thing that works for my family, and it's in the range of the kinds of risks that I'm taking, and I'm going to take all the precautions that I can, but ultimately this is the choice that I'm going to make. And I think those are both reasonable choices and not choices that we should be judging people for, uh, for making. Uh, so, uh, so I want to uh, close on a, a sort of final note. So th this book is sort of all about kind of approaching your parenting in a, in a very, um, some people would say high effort uh, way, where you think a lot about the, the decisions and sort of are quite careful in making choices and read a lot of data. And you know, on the one hand, it's relaxed. But on the other hand, you know, I think I'm often talking to an audience of people who are kind of spending a lot of time like thinking about all the stuff that they're, that they're doing. And, and of course, I write partly uh, in that way because I myself am a highly neurotic uh, person who does that all the time. Um, so uh, so I, I wanted to end the talk with the, with the way I end the book, um, which, is, uh, which is what with basically the best parenting advice um, that I have ever gotten, which is a story about bees. So when my daughter was, uh, was almost two, we were going on vacation to a location um, where we had been before, and it has a lot of bees. Uh, and it's also somewhat isolated. And so not like very isolated, not like the jungle, but like, you know, there was, it's like a 10 minute drive from a town. And I had gotten one of these things that you get as a parent in your head where like, I just got like obsessed with the idea that she was going to be stung by a bee and she had never been stung before and she was going to be allergic. And I just like got it in my head and I couldn't get rid of it and I was sort of thinking about it and so we come to our well child visit and I have my usual like like Google Doc list of things to ask the doctor about and this is on there and so I like start in with you know we're going to this place it's very isolated there's a lot of bees here are some solutions I've come up with you know first we could, could we just get an EpiPen like just in case or maybe we could just have her tested for this allergy like what you know what do you think is the right approach that we should take to my important bee situation that I've got here and and we had this like really wonderful pediatrician Dr. Lee and Dr. Lee just sort of, she would always just like, let me talk. And she said, let me talk. And then I finished, she said, yeah. Well, I would just try not to think about that. <laughs> and, and of course, like, it was, the reason it's such good advice was, was actually what she could have said was, you know, the first time people get stung by a bee, actually they don't typically have a terrible reaction. So like this, you know, like if she does and she has any, like she could have given me a sort of sciencey answer to this, but I think she sort of understood in the moment, like, just don't think about that. You know, this isn't, probably this isn't going to come up. If it comes up, you, you, you know, it's not going to be a tragedy. You're going to deal with it in the, uh, in the moment, but you can't approach all of your parenting decisions with this kind of like high intensity that, uh, that, that you want to do. And I think for me, that was kind of, that's something I, I think about a lot when I'm in the moment uh, of something that actually isn't a super important decision, I've somehow gotten myself worked up at it. You know, like, let's just, let's just try not, I just try not to, to think about, try not to think about that. Uh, so let me stop there.
that's great advice. Um, I am really excited to be here. And before I get started on talking about crib sheets, which everyone should buy, um, I want to thank Chelsea for including me. Um, and I want to give a shout out to humanprogress.org, which Chelsea manages. Um, if you're on Twitter, I am addicted to Twitter. Uh, you should follow Human Progress. It is a ray of sunshine in a dark place. Um, they have daily updates and great stories that talk about how human progress, um, the human condition is improving. Um, so definitely follow them. And thanks again, Chelsea. And I'm very, very excited to be here with Emily, um, both professionally and personally, professionally, because I write about these issues as well, slightly different subject matter than Emily, but I also write about these issues. And I feel like Emily is um, and I think everyone would agree Emily is the most important voice on these issues, and she's really brought a tremendous amount of peace and comfort and reassurance to parents. Um, we need to change the narrative about parenting, and I think Emily's done a tremendous amount to do that. Um, personally, I am just shy of single white female level fan of Emily because... Um, <laughs> Um, and I'm trying to be really cool, but it's hard because I read Emily's books. I actually read Emily's books. They came out in 2013, and by then I was well into my toddler years with my three boys. Um, and I wish I'd had, well, I particularly wish I'd had crib sheets when I was going through pregnancy and then dealing with my kids those first years after because it's a wealth of information and really the data that's in the books is really important. Again, Emily mentioned, you know, th there's a lot of one-size-fits-all advice out there, um, but that doesn't always suit everyone. So I want to talk to you all about reading Emily's books, um, you know, as a reader, and why, the three things that I think make her book so unique. I, I would say the first thing is her compassion. Um, sometimes when I write on these subjects, it's very easy to be a little bit snarky about the things parents are doing. For instance, a trend that is now quite common is to eat your own placenta. That actually happens. People do it, put it in stir fries, they grind it into smoothies, and some enterprising people have created pill where you can dry it and grind it and stick it in a pill. And for people who really don't want to eat their own placenta, but feel like there's some sort of medicinal quality to this. And there is actual new data on that which shows that it's not necessary, so don't, don't eat your placenta. Um, but uh, Emily doesn't do that. She's not condescending and she's not snarky. She's very kind in her book. And I was reviewing the book last night and kind of refamiliarizing myself with some of the chapters, and I turned it over and saw a quote. This is sort of praise for her book. And I saw this quote from Amy Schumer, the comedian who just had a baby, and she writes this wonderful blurb about the book. She says, Emily Oster is the non-judgmental girlfriend holding your hand and guiding us through pregnancy and motherhood. She has done the work to get us the hard facts in a soft, understandable way. There's really no better way to say it. And it's funny, I met Emily in the green room downstairs, and we had never met before, before but I felt like I had known her for a lot of years because at a time, even though I had already gone through um, having all of my children, she brought me a lot of reassurance because truly the guilt lingers. And Emily mentioned the breastfeeding issue and the co-sleeping issue. And here I had a five-year-old, a six-year-old, and a three-year-old, and I was still wondering, did I make the right decision? You know, she talks about, um, you know, these, these decisions being so important. And so to read something that says, you know, there's really no studies concluding that this is definitely the right way to do it was very reassuring. Um, the second thing is um, the data that Emily provides in these books. It is an amazing amount of research that, go, that went into this book. And you wrote this book when you have still very young children. So it was, really is amazing how dense this is with data. But like a lot of economic books, and I don't mean to criticize your, your colleagues, but they can be a little dry. And, um, and sorry to the Cato right. folks here in the audience, but uh, it, they can be a little bit dry. But her, you can tell as you're reading this book that she has tangled with these issues. She has struggled with these, these issues. And she's giving you advice that she herself has dealt with. The thing that I, what was really 
hard for me when I was having children before Emily's books came out was there, there certainly was a lot of information out there. Um, there were uh, blogs, Facebook groups, there were newspaper stories and magazine articles from celebrity moms. Um, but those were always opinions. Um, and the, the guidebooks, like what to expect when you're expecting and the Dr. Spock book and some of the other um, more expert level books, um, they, they were fine, but again, very clinical. And then on the other side, with the things I mentioned earlier, with the mommy blogs and, um, and sort of the, the, the parenting groups, a lot of it was opinion. Um, you should do this. You should do this. You're a better parent. And that's always the sort of message that if you really want to mom harder and be the best mom, uh, then you'll do these things. Um, the third thing I will say, and this is, I think, the best part of Emily's book, is when you are in this state of parenting, new parenting, you get this sense, and Emily touched on this, that the decision you are making for your child will be, he's either going to, he or she is either going to be a contributing member of society that perhaps cures cancer, or he's going to be living in a van down by the river. So you, and literally there's no space in between there. It's literally, he's going to be a success if I breastfeed, or he's going to be like a hoodlum. And, and so um, one thing that is really remarkable in, in Emily's book, and um, in one section she talks about, for those of you who, who've never experienced this, when you have the baby, you have a choice. Do you want the baby with you in the, in the hospital room, or do you want him in the nursery? Well, with the first baby, I don't want him away from me for a second. I want him with me all the time. Nobody's going to see my baby. I'm going to be there the whole time. With the third, I was acting like the hospital was a spa, and I wanted really nothing much to do with him except at feeding time. And, um, and so, the, and the thing is, is you know, so I carried a little guilt about that one, but the, the greatest thing is that I, I could have, with that first one, I was exhausting. Emily talks about this. Pregnancy and giving birth is a physically exhausting process, and it's okay to need a two-hour nap. Yet, with the first baby, I was so spun up that I, I would never have allowed that. I, I was, in 2007, when I had my first child, it was peak breast is best. That might not be true. It could have been peak in 2002. I don't know. But it felt like it was peak in 2007. And I was completely irrational about the breastfeeding to the point that I once left the house and told my husband I'd be back in 20 minutes, and I wasn't back for two hours, and my baby was hysterical um, for two hours because I wouldn't I didn't have formula, but my husband also knew not to allow any formula because I was so crazed. And so my child was unhappy, my husband was unhappy, I was unhappy. And so this, this narrative out there that you could be doing it better, there are, you know, this is the only way that you should be raising a child really does lead to some irrational and frankly not good behaviors on the part of parents. Um, and again, what you'll find is, and what was so remarkable about this book is, she talks about rooming in, potty training, discipline, whether to let your child cry it out. And overwhelmingly, and I'm not sure on each of those, but overwhelmingly, the evidence, Emily constantly says, you know, there's studies on both sides, and, you know, really, it's up to you. I mean, if there is a clear evidence, Emily will tell you that, look, this appears to be the better way. But it was really great to see the frequency with which there isn't really conclusive evidence that one type of parenting is the way to go. Um, so the narrative today in many cases, and this is why I write about this issue too, and I really focus more on sort of the things that are you purchase in the grocery store, for instance, food. You know, if you don't, if you eat GMOs, or if you eat, allow your child to have pesticides, um, if you don't eat organic, these kinds of things. So it's a different area, but the message is the same, which is there's a there is a better way to do parenting. There is a preferred way to do parenting, and if you don't, you're doing it wrong. Actually, I I keep headlines in a file on my computer when I scan the newspapers. I if there's a particularly hilarious headline, I I put them in this little file. And my favorite one is, and this was an, in actual magazine, 100 Ways You Are Failing as a Parent. <laughs> failing. Um, and so that's what a lot of parents are seeing today. And it's, it makes parenting so fraught, so joyless, so stressful. Um, I'll conclude, and I know probably people have a lot of questions for Emily, so I don't want to go on too much longer, but I'll conclude by saying that I often talk to my mom about these issues. She knows that I write on these issues, and she's really interested. And, 
I remember once she, she just said, I don't know why everyone's so stressed out. You guys have so much more information than we did, right? And I said, well, that's kind of the issue. That's kind of the reason why we're so stressed. So what it's really about is discernment, right? Being able to discern what's a good source of information and what's a bad source of information. The problem, too, is though, who has time for that, right? Who has time to actually read the studies? Emily doesn't even insist you read her whole book. The greatest part about this book is the crib sheets that she offers at the end of, could I just find, why didn't I mark this? OK. At the end of each chapter, she, it's, it's the crib sheets. It's the bottom line. So if you have a question about rooming in or discipline or potty training, you don't even have, because you're a busy mom, you don't even have to, and dad, sorry, uh, you don't even have to read the whole chapter. She has sort of summarized um, at the end of each chapter. So Emily really understands parents, how busy they are, and how much we need to be reassured. So thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you, Julie. OK, so before we go to q and A, I I do have a quick question for both of you just to get the discussion uh, started. Emily, when you were researching this book, and Julie, when you were reading it, uh, since we're all devoted to a data-based, evidence-based view of the world, were there any areas where the data particularly surprised you and how much it diverged from either the conventional wisdom or your own preconceptions? That's interesting. I mean, I think there are not that many things in, in crib sheet where the data is like really strongly in one direction or another. I will say the the or maybe the weakness of data in some areas was surprising. Yeah, I'm I'm never surprised by how bad data is. <laughs> I don't know. Um, I mean, I think so. One the you know the one piece that I that I talk about as being kind of pretty evidence based is this idea of allergen introduction, and so yeah. that was something where I hadn't I had sort of understood that we had evolved over time into thinking that you should give your kids say peanuts when they're when they're younger. Um, but I, I don't think I had sort of, until I actually did the research for that part of the book, I don't think I, I had really recognized how strong that evidence was and how far it diverged from what we had been telling people, people before. Um, I will say just in reading the book, I was surprised by how much, and I mentioned this in, when I was talking about it, is how much that there isn't certainty yeah. in the studies that I was expecting, you know, when I was like, oh, rooming in, what, 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 what does it say? And the, I actually marked it. The, con you know, the conclusion basically is, Emily says, look, there's not really a lot of evidence either way. If you need to take a nap, you shouldn't feel any shame. So I think that was my, that was what I was surprised by. But I will, te I will tell you in um, expecting better, just the stuff on coffee. Yeah. The stuff on having, a, having some beer, having a glass of beer, you know. You know, uh, it, that, that was, I think I was much more surprised by the revelations in your first book, and I think everyone was, yeah. than this one. Yeah, which. I think a big, so one of the things that people say both, have given me both positive and negative feedback on about the difference is like people say like, oh, I read Expecting Better, you told me all these interesting facts about how like I can do whatever, and you know, it's like, not, not whatever, right, but like, right. you know, I do, you told me all these interesting <laughs> facts, and like there were so many places where the data really like told me what the answer was, and I thought that you were gonna do the same thing in crib sheet, and then I yeah. opened it up, and you were like, you kinda do whatever, you know, you, there's a lot of good choices, and I think that that's, like that's just that is what the data. That was the brilliance of it. That was what the I data mean. I can said, understand that some people want like they wanted shit. answers. But I yeah. think one thing that we lose with the current sort of parenting narrative is we tell women don't trust your instincts, and or and also like doesn't matter what your mom did, okay? She was trying to kill you, right? And because that's I talked to I actually one interesting thing is talk to an older mom, talk to a grandmother, right, and say. What do you think about parents today? It's so funny because I had a grandmother who came over to my house with her little, with her grandson, and I said, "Hey, it was a hot day. Hey, everybody want a popsicle?" And the mom said, "He would love one as long as they're 100% fruit, organic." And she had this list, and it was not from her. She kind of rolled her eyes as she said it. Yeah. It was from the mom. And so, um, so I think one thing that's really nice is that. It kind of tells women, like, you know, you can probably trust your instincts on a lot of stuff, or maybe trust your mom. <laughs> right, maybe trust your mom, yeah. yeah. All right, uh, so with that, we've got plenty of time for Q&A, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, first, please wait to be called upon. 
Uh, we have got microphones coming around towards you, and so everyone in the room and our audience online can hear you. Please wait to be called upon before asking. Um, if you could announce your name and affiliation, if you have one at the start of your question, uh, that would also be very welcome. Uh, please ask your question in the form of a question, and please keep your questions brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. So please raise your hands. Let's start the Q&A. Um, uh, lady with the... Lady with the... Lady with the teething necklace. <laughs> yeah. It is really nice to see so many moms and babies here today. I agree. It's really cool. We have a microphone heading toward you now. Do you want to just say it? And, yeah, then, we'll all, and then I'll repeat, we'll repeat yeah, we'll it. Yeah, we'll repeat it. Uh, coming right. now. So, uh, almost here. Hold on, hold on. Oh, oh, here. sorry. We want the online Chelsea's, is, Chelsea's a stickler. Oh, okay. Online uh, stuff. Yeah. Okay. Hi, my name is Laura. Um, I love love your books a lot. Um, my question is in regard to um, vaccines. You present a lot of, you know, like there are choices about all these different things. And then when you get to vaccines, I've kind of never viewed that as a choice. But in today's world, it seems like it is a choice. So when you were going to um, to write the book, and I, how did you approach that? And what did you encounter in approaching that? Yeah, so I thought a, a lot about the question of whether I should even have a chapter on vaccines. So just to be clear, what I say about vaccines is that they are safe and effective and people should vaccinate their kids. It's one of the very few things in the book where I kind of calm down on like, you should, you should do this. Uh, and so I thought, about, I, I thought about whether I should just say, I, like, just like, that's it, like, just you should vaccine, and, or just like, le almost like leave that out. Um, and, and, you know, but I, I, I wanted to, to write about it because I, I think that we, there are a lot of people who do not vaccinate their kids. Uh, this has become more of a, of a thing. Um, and I, I think part of the issue I perceived at the time uh, was that on the one hand, you know, we, we tell people vaccines are safe and effective, but we tell them in a kind of aggressive experty voice. Like I'm the CDC and I say vaccine are safe and effective and you should trust me because I'm like an, I'm a, a doctor. And then on the other hand, the, the sort of anti-vaccination movement has done actually a pretty good job of, uh, of kind of seeming like they are science-based and saying, we'll see this study, you know, here's some data on what's in the vaccines and you do really want to have put this in your, in your kid where of course it's like, well, Yes, yes, you do want to put those things in you. There's no reason to think that you should be worried about those. So, um, so, and I, I think the other thing that happens is, of course, some people do have adverse vaccine reactions. That has happened. It's not that that's impossible. And so by just continuing to tell people it's safe and effective, it's safe and effective, then when someone says, well, what about this one adverse vaccine interaction? Like, well, actually, yes, of course, but broadly it's safe and effective. And so I wanted in the chapter to actually take those concerns seriously and really go through and say, okay, what are the things that people People might be worried about what is the actual evidence on risks, which shows people that those are not things that you should actually be worried about. Like those are those are not realistic risks for you. And so I thought that if I did that, I could um, I could maybe help this conversation evolve in a better direction. I will say, um, reflecting now. Uh, I don't think that I achieved anything there <laughs> um, because I think the truth is that like the. There are some people already going to vaccinate their kids. They're reading my books. They already they kind of like move through. Oh, it's interesting. Thanks. Uh, and then there are, there are some people who do not going to vaccinate their kids for whom this information is not valuable. And I've had some some interactions with people um, post publication, perfectly nice interactions, where the way that people are talking about this made me kind of realize like there's nothing that I could say that would be that would be convincing, which was sort of frustrating. But so anyway, that's how I thought about that's how I thought about that chapter. Uh, just to add to that, um, we do have a lot of data on humanprogress.org about rising vaccination rates Great. throughout the world, and I do think that's one of the most positive innovations um, that we've had for public health recently. And I'm very pro-vaccination, so that chapter was not surprising to me, but I also love the way that you approached it in a very non-condescending manner, laying out all of that information to address people's concerns and to sort of trust them to look at it, and I hope that people do read what you have to say and really consider it. Yeah, I hope so. Um, so other questions? Uh -huh. um, gentlemen up front. Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm Dave, and uh, when, my, when my mother was raising her kids uh, in the middle of the last century, 
She and everybody that she knew followed the Bible, which was Dr. Spock. Dr. Spock. Today, there are dozens of different religious tracts. I'm wondering, does the fact that there was one Bible in that time, is there evidence that the parents were less, were more relaxed than they are today? I, I think, by the way, before you answer this, that this sort of gets at uh, the question of why is it important, this idea you talk about, um, that there are different best decisions for parents as opposed to a single right answer? Yeah, I mean, what do you think? Well, I, 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 I definitely think women in your, and parents in your mother's generation, certainly even my mother uh, had, uh, was, was much more calm about her decisions. And I often will think about how stressed my generation of mothers my friends are. I mean, I talk to my friends about how stressed they are and, and how worried they are that they're making the wrong decision for their children. And yet, and then I think back on when my mom was raising children, she didn't have air conditioning. She didn't have, a, she had a washer, but she didn't have a dryer. She would haul the heavy, wet clothes out to the line. Um, she didn't have any of the tools that I used to distract my kids. In other words, don't talk to me so I can get something done, right? She didn't have that. She didn't have a lot of those tools, except we would go out during the day and not come out till night. So maybe that was it. But, um, you know, she didn't have, you know, you, you shouldn't have the internet to look up recipes, whatever. There's just so many things today that make living easier. I mean, again, humanprogress.org is a great, you know, is a great, they have a great database on that. Um, but I, I think a little bit of it is just the amount of information out there and, and the narrative that you are truly, you're not just doing it wrong, but you're actually harming your ch children. Um, it's, it's a little bit self-imposed, self-created anxiety, uh, but there, I don't think there's any doubt that women 100 years ago, 50 years ago, really had to rely on their instincts or what their mothers did. Um, and it just, there wasn't as much judgment out there, certainly not out on the internet. Um, I don't know if that covers it. Yeah, I mean, I think the other thing that's happened over, so I, this question of like, is, is the fact that there was one Dr. Spock helpful, I think is an interesting one that I hadn't thought much about. On the sort of broader question of how, how it is sort of parenting now different, I think the other thing that's true is that people in this, in you know, my generation are parenting much later than my parents were or, you know, their, their parents uh, or their parents were. And, and I think, you know, we're parenting later, we're parenting having achieved other things. And I think sometimes parenting can take on this kind of achievement orientation that I think was less common, right? So it's sort of like, okay, I went, like, I went to college, I achieved, I graduated from college, I achieved the job, I became, you know, I achieved, like, I achieved, and now, like, I'm going to achieve this. And I'm going to get promoted to the best version of this that just like I did at, at my job, you know? And I, I think parenting isn't always as amenable to that type of achievement. Um, and, but it, it does add a kind of layer of competitiveness that wasn't yeah, like, as it, co common. A, a, on Facebook every year, there's um, the starting school pictures. Right. Right. And I don't, there are women, and I'm sorry if you no, did no, this, but I'm there not, are women not, who have these signs that are like, I know one woman who embroiders a sign for her children. It's like, Emily, second grade. Right. And I'm like, I can't even get them to like look nice in the morning and like, barely make them a sandwich. And so, and I mean, there, that is like, that's kind of, to me, that's just send them to school. My mother, she would never have made a sign, right? And so, but again, it's like Facebook, you put, you're kind of saying, oh, look what I did, you know, in this, and so I just think that the stakes are higher. There's opportunities now to make yourself look like the perfect mom. And so you add, you, you it's self-imposed sort of pressure. Very interesting. I do not. I am not a sign maker. I love you. I'm not a sign maker. No, and I'm also also my kids have like no pants. It's like <laughs> it's like I sent my kid the first day of school his pants. He was like, Mom, these pants are too short. I was like, They're fine. They're fine. They're fine. That's a style. That's a style that we have now where they don't go up below your chin, your right. knee. That's, we're doing that now. Great, great uh, insights. Um, uh, in the back uh, with the baby and uh, glasses. Oh, the cute baby. A sleeping baby. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Melanie and this is Gavin who's eight weeks and um, we are big fans of your book and really tried to channel it in making a decision about getting um, a tongue tie release and it turns out that this is a really hot topic these days and there's a lot of studies about it and it felt like a really huge decision and we really tried to channel you and say it's probably not going to change life course what decision we make but just wondering if you had come across these studies and what your thoughts are on it. 
Yeah, so this actually has become like a hugely, hugely like a controversial topic at the moment. So just to be to be clear, uh, your your tongue is attached to your the bottom of your mouth with a with a ligament, uh, and so one of the one there is some discussion of and so. If, you're, if the ligament is too short, it can interfere with all kinds of things. And in fact, it is, it is a thing where it can be much too short and it can interfere with speech yeah. and, other, and other kinds of things. It has become a very common diagnosis for people who are having trouble breastfeeding. And I think the general consensus, like there's a lot of debate about whether it is over, like does this help? Is it overdiagnosed? You know, there's a there's a surgery associated with you. Know, you can basically cut it. Um, so my you know my sense of that debate um, now, having talked to a bunch of pediatricians and read a bunch of papers about this, is that it is almost certainly way way overdiagnosed, um, and that it mostly does not improve breastfeeding, although it can help with pain. So I think the best evidence is that is that it for that it can help with like the the pain aspect of breastfeeding for moms, but then in terms of the kind of the amount of milk that the that the kid gets, it does not seem to be like a huge, a, a huge thing. Um, and so, you know, I think it is a pretty small, it is a small procedure. So I can see sort of like, you know, thinking that you should do it, but we're clearly doing more of this than is really appropriate. Um. Uh, thank you, a lady in a pink. Hi, my name is Erica. Um, thank you for coming to Washington, DC. We're a policy town. And so uh, a lot of policies created out of the studies that, that you yourself have referenced. And so my question is, have you had the opportunity to brief policymakers kind of on your findings? And if so, how your first book sort of did a lot more myth busting. Your second book, like you said, more sort of puts at ease, I think, the decision making process. Have you had that opportunity to talk about ways to influence, you know, the dialogue around public health and maternity leave policies, you know, employer benefits, like all the stuff you're looking yeah. at? does have a higher uh, possibility of, of influencing you know, how parents are able to parent even in today's society? Yes, yeah, so the short answer is not, uh, not really. So I mean, I talk to a lot of doctors um, about, and so I think the, the sort of parts of the book that are like, you know, helping people make better medical decisions, I think I get some traction with like individual practitioners and, and patients. On the, the kind of broader policy um, policy stuff I you know I think there's one piece of that which is like should we have different policies around kind of the advice we give expectant mothers um, and I would say I've made no progress on that and I'm not sure that's so terrible in the sense that I think that there are there are a lot of considerations that go into like what general advice you would give the whole population that is different from the kinds of advice you would give in a, in a book like this and you know the CDC has other uh, considerations beyond the kinds of stuff that I'm doing um, the place that I hope that I can have more policy impact, and I think it just remains to be seen how that uh, how that goes with this book, are things like like paid parental leave, where I think the evidence is like so clearly in the direction. I'm not certainly not many people say this, and I think it's just like clear that uh, clear that paid parental leave is a good um, is a good idea. Uh, and if I have some platform that I can use to to promote that, I think that that I I would like to uh, I would like to do that. I would just like. Respond to that as well. Um, so coming at this from my own you know, libertarian perspective, I guess I question whether given that so many recommendations do not reflect the best evidence and given the limitations of the evidence, um, I question why we need so many official recommendations in the first place and campaigns that just sort of tell people how to try to parent. Um, but also on the topic of paid leave, I do also just want to say in the spirit of making decisions you know, like an economist that animates this book, um, I think that like with every policy decision, you do have to consider not only the benefits, but also the costs. Uh, Cato has a paid leave survey that found that you know, the vast majority of people are supportive of paid leave about three quarters when no costs are mentioned. But if you mention any costs, like raised tax taxes or uh, cuts to other welfare benefits, that support does uh, drop. If you mention cuts to welfare benefits of any kind, such as social security or education, it actually flips completely so that three quarters of people then are not supportive of paid leave. Now, I'm not saying whether it's a good idea or not, because frankly, that's not my policy area, but I do just think that when it comes to decision making, it's always important to weigh costs as well as benefits, which I do believe there are many of. Um, I, I just have one thing to say. IWF actually, I know this is not a paid leave conversation, oh, but um, IWF has a really interesting uh, budget neutral paid leave program where you can dip into your social security savings um, and then work the six weeks to eight weeks on the back end. And so that's an interesting proposal to consider that 
um, really addresses the costs. So somewhere in between these two, like we definitely need them. And then um, worrying, because we also worry about those costs. So that's another option. But I do want to just mention one thing where I think your breastfeeding information is so vital from a policy perspective. And I think that's a great question, Erica, because um, a couple years ago, and I think it was under Bloomberg, he was so invested in this breast is best that they passed some sort of, and I'm, I'm a little bit fuzzy on the details, but there was some sort of rule passed where the hospitals, you had to get oh, some yeah. sort of- Baby friendly. Yes, baby, baby friendly. friendly. You had to get some sort of like permission and fill out paperwork to get formula. They essentially were making it much more difficult and like much more, like you had to go through this whole paper pushing kind of process in order to get formula. And I mean, the formula was locked up like it was an opioid. And so um, I think one thing that I would say about this book, and, and there's other people writing about and really kind of trying to myth bust on that breast is best best narrative. Um, that's one area where it has led to bad policy. And so I think what Emily's written here can hopefully reverse that a little bit. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, in the front, in the red uh, sweatshirt. Wait, can we take, let's take we the take question the in the back. Yeah, the, a, yeah take uh, the baby. Like, babies get first. And then we'll come back to you, I promise. <laughs> babies first, babies first. You should pull a baby out of your backpack. Oh, I have one. Yeah. <laughs> Since we don't want to sit down, apparently. <laughs> um, my name is Paula, and uh, I'm actually curious because I'm in the data different mindset, and uh, but I have a bunch of early childhood educators in my family, and you know they've been well. I've been doing this for 30 years. I don't care what your numbers say. This is how you should do it. Like you're a second class parent if you do it this way. And so my question to you guys is, how have you? Is there a way and how do you have productive conversations? Because right now we're just going the path of avoidance and but like how can you engage productively with people that are not, not, not driven by personal belief and faith rather than data? Mm, that's hard. We should have taken the front <laughs> question. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I, I don't, I, I don't, I think I'm very lucky because my parents are economists. Um, and so when them, you know, it's, but I do have these kind of interactions a lot with my mother-in-law, um, who has a lot of, who I love and is a wonderful person. Um, she's not watching. And who's not, she may be, you know, but no, Joyce is, she, Joyce is the best. Right. But, uh, but, you know, she's not as into, is into data. Um, and I, you know, I think that it's not, in, in some ways these are conversations where you're like, I find like sometimes I'm just talking past people. Like I have this, this evidence and it's sort of like, well, that's how I, I, that's how I feel. And partly for me, like, that is the only currency I have, right? Like, I've got what I have is, like, what the evidence says. I don't have some other currency to, like, bring to the, to bring to the table. Um, and so I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure what there, like, what there is other than avoidance and just the feeling of, like, okay, well, I'm making this choice. Like, thanks for your, thanks for your input. And I think th the thing I find the hardest about those conversations is when people are, like, you're doing it wrong. I'm just, like, you know, thanks for your input. Um, I, and I would just add to that because I've had similar stresses um, with, and not so much family for, for me, but people that are close to us. And I think the one thing to, to remember is that none of this matters in a couple years. Like, I know that sounds dismissive, but, you know, somebody's really passionate thoughts about potty training, it all goes away. And I, I do feel like that's a little bit um, reassuring because you, I remember when I was in that, I was in that moment. I felt like this is my life for the rest of my life. I'm gonna be having these arguments and it really does, uh, it passes. So, but I, I think it's tough. And I think having a tone also of, you know, just being patient with people. And like Emily said, this is the decision I've made is the only way you can yeah. tackle it. Okay, now, now, we got, now we got the right you. Yeah, <laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Michael from Georgetown University. And uh, um, I have watched several videos uh, about the book on YouTube. And we know that uh, you are a professional economist. And economist isn't the first person we expect to get parenting advice from. So how do you decide to apply that framework to this object, uh, subject? Uh, another question is that, uh, do you have any plans to publish a book about uh, how to be a good father using uh, data. 
Data uh, analysis, yeah. Okay, so I will say on the second question, I think that, that the crib sheet is not intended to be gender gender specific. So I do end up talking a lot about moms, partly because I'm a mom and so on. But I, I think a lot of this stuff about parenting is just like, you know, if like you could have two two moms, two dads, one mom. Like I think it's kind of about being a good parent, not just about being good um, being good mom. Not really about being a good, about, I don't know, how to be a, a parent. Yeah. Um, but let's face it, moms tend to... We do more. Yeah. And, um, you know, yeah. and make these things bigger. And that's true, and obsess more. That's probably true. Um, so on the first question, how did I get into this? I mean, the short answer is I got pregnant. Um, and so I was an economist. I'm still an economist. Uh, and I got, I got pregnant, and I, I found myself you know, sort of frustrated and with some of the advice I was getting and some of the way it was being presented. And then I found myself doing a lot of the kinds of things that I did for my job in service of my pregnancy. So I think in some ways, as I, said, as I said at the beginning, like it seems a bit weird to have an economist doing this, but actually like economics is really about decision making, it's about data, it's about evidence. Um, and I am a health economist, so a lot of my research is about health data, selection in health data, you know, empirical methods. Um, so it's not, the books are not as far topically from my academic work as you might, um, as, you, as you might think. And I think it is a little bit of a different perspective and that's part of why people Part of why people will like it, I think. I don't know. Um, let's uh, go for the, the lady in the middle in the blue uh, dress uh, that's floral. Yes, yeah. yes, you, in the middle. Thanks to all of you. This is so interesting. My name is Carol Pollack Nelson. I'm a human factor psychologist. I specialize in consumer behavior as it applies to safe use of consumer products. And I've been doing this for a long time. Um, one thing I thought was so interesting that you said that I find very true myself is when you had that slide up showing the different factors that you control for. Because a lot of times these types of um, you know, um, items or whatever are discussed in the limitation section of a, publish of a publication. Yes. To some of us when we're reading those, and I'm a reviewer for a lot of uh, journals, and a lot of times when you get to the publications, you're thinking it's just like, oh, by the way, you know, <laughs> right. But it seems like you really are saying, and I think it's true, that if you really want to understand, especially when there's either conflicting science or not enough science, that looking at the limitations is really important. So this must have been something you had that caused a lot of work for you. And I wanted to know about that. And even when you talk, for example, about family leave, almost every study I think that you look at is it true or no? I'm asking you that you need to be really have a lot of consideration about the controls, about the factors that weren't studied and that sort of thing. So if you can comment about that. Sure, yeah. So it, like a ton of work of the book uh, is trying to like sort of te tease out basically which of the papers have better empirical methods. Um, that is the thing that I am in. That is my job. Like that is what I do at my academic. That's like basically my academic specialty is kind of figuring out how we, how we learn about causality largely from observational data. Um, so I think one distinction between the way that I would like analyze a literature about something like breastfeeding versus the way that it would be sort of more commonly done in something like epidemiology is I tend to basically say a lot of the papers on this are not just, are like we just should not look at it all. That there are many papers which I just am going to put to the side and say like even though there are thousands of, you know, there's many, many, many papers that correlate breastfeeding with IQ, I'm just going to put them to the side because we cannot, because the limitations are so extreme. And it, in some sense, I don't have to look, I don't always have to look at the limit. I can see from the tables that they're not, they're not going to be enough. And then there's a smaller set of papers, much smaller, uh, pile of things that have better empirical methods. And so that's, that sort of distinction, that's like a, a huge piece of the book. Uh, and it's, I think it is in some ways a lot of what I am bringing to this that would be different from what other people would, um, would bring. On something like paid family leave, um, yes, it is true that there are many studies that have this kind of issue about like the kinds of people who have paid family leave are different from those who do not. The best evidence on this and the stuff that I focus on in the book is, is, ran is it's not randomized, but it's, it's relying on policy variation. So it's relying on, say, changes in, um, 
in the, the paid family, in like sort of uh, access to unpaid family leave. So there, at some point, the Family Medical Leave Act came in, and that came in. And sort of we can look, we can use that to try to figure out the effects of family leave. There are changes in Europe in sort of where, they, where maternity leave is extended or, or not extended. And you can look at different cohorts, and you can look over time. So those are the kinds of studies that get relied on for that. Um, and that's a pretty active literature with actually a lot of pretty good identification. So, um, so there, that's, that, I think that, that evidence Evidence is fairly uh, is fairly compelling. And on that topic, again, as long as we're on it, we also do have data on humanprogress.org on sort of the um, the increase that you've seen in paid leave. And we have data that Cato's uh, actual specialists who work on this have done to show the proliferation of paid leave provided without a mandate. Actually, within the U.S., more companies are choosing to do this on their own without a mandate. But again, not my issue area. Yeah, um, I think that's super important, but also there are a lot of very poor people who do not work for firms that give access to this, who have like two weeks of time off that they've accrued, and then they have to go back to work. Obviously, uh, as is the point of the book. We are determined to make this a paid leave yeah. debate. Yeah, I don't know, I'm, not, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I'm, I'm, really, I'm really biting my tongue right now. It's hard. OK, OK. Uh, so let's try to keep it focused on crib okay. sheet then. Um, lady uh, in black. The front center. Again, try to stay on topic. <laughs> um, so I'm guessing your kids are relatively young because you sort of started your academic or these books with pregnancy and now we're talking about early childhood. My kids are much older and I wonder if you plan to expand your work um, into later childhood because you still have a lot of these extreme debates going on as they get older. You know, a few that come to mind. They shouldn't have cell phones. You know, they'll all get depressed and kill themselves if they have <laughs> cell phones. They need to be outside. or No, vi no video games. Right, or video games are fine. They are actually educational. Right. And, you know, I'm going to get my kid trained in some sport and devote all my time and resources to getting them a co college scholarship <laughs> versus, you know, would it be economically better just to put a little money in the bank every month? Um, and so... Free-range parenting versus helicopter parenting, right? All these debates go on ultimately to whether or not there are better outcomes if they go to Ivy League schools versus state schools or schools that nobody's heard of. And I, so I just wonder if you plan to apply these theories. I'm having an anxiety attack with that. Later stages in life, I think it would be very helpful. Um, so... Uh, I'm Probably. Um, so, I, so I think what's, uh, what's very challenging for me about imagining the sort of moving to the next, my kids are four and eight, um, so I'm sort of edging into this. Um, what's very challenging for me about moving into this is that I think that uh, there are some things, you mentioned a bunch of them, which kind of a lot of many parents wonder about, but then the kinds of questions that come up with kids uh, in these older ages are quite a bit more varied. Um, so there isn't as much, I think that with the little kids, there's a lot of commonality, sleep, you know, breastfeed. Like there's a lot of sort of, you can isolate more of the big topics. I think for, uh, for older kids, there's a wider range of things. The data is, is less good, more complicated. Um, and so I, I think if I, if I do another one, um, which I probably will, uh, it will be more about the process of decision making and sort of how do you think about structuring uh, structuring decisions about questions like this. There will be a bunch of data, but that will be the sort of the idea will be to help people have a framework to to start talking about those decisions and then show them some some data, which are like inputs to that to that framework. But um, I think it will be structured a little differently. But basically, yes. And then you but you it, gave a good outline of well many of the topics that. But we'll, it is interesting in how it never ends. Like right. you know, Crib Sheets was the perfect sequel to Expecting Better. And then, like you said, Jennifer, it's there, but there's so many. I'm, I've got a son who's 12. He started middle school, and I'm supposed to be freaking out about vaping. And actually, this is something that I looked at. Yeah, I know. Vaping. I know, oh. it's coming. Okay. And, um, it's fine. But this is an issue that I tackled recently because I'm genuinely interested if there's a teen vaping epidemic. The word epidemic is overused. overused. And so I actually looked at this, and it's really fascinating. And for any Ch uh, parents of a middle schooler, I'm about to make you feel better. Um, it, it turns out that there's been this increase in vaping, um, but when you look at the CDC and how they measured it, they didn't determine, so they basically went out and asked a bunch of teens, do you vape? And kids were like, yep. And what, the, what they didn't do was say, well, how often? And so there are kids who like vape once at a party to look cool, and they're in the bucket of 
teen vapors, the CDC's bucket of teen vapors. The other interesting thing is that many of them vape with non-nicotine liquid. So it's not, they're not vulnerable to the addictive qualities. They're just trying to look cool, right? Which I, we all remember that, well, maybe, maybe some naturally cool people in here didn't do that as a teen, but I took every opportunity to look cool as a teen. And so I did some stupid things, and, and that's what a lot of kids are doing with vaping. And so when you actually look at the actual number, the percentage of teen vapors is around 5%. Now, that's not good. The, 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 the 5% is habitual teen vapors. So that's not great, and that's certainly worthy tackling for the, for the CDC. But the, to tell parents that there's an epidemic, that everyone's vaping, right, is terrifying and upsetting and worrisome, and people don't understand the difference between smoking and vaping. And so um, I, I do think, I think that should be your next book. But I do think that there is a lot of data out there, and there's, it's really fascinating to see how, um, how these numbers can be manipulated, um, and, and that's really the reason people are so scared. I will say yesterday in the car, my four-year-old was like, Mom, what, at what age can I get a phone? <laughs> and I was like, Am I there? when you're 100. Right. <laughs> and he was like, how about when I'm 16? I was like, okay, yeah. We can I was like, we can talk about it when you're 16. I want to get that on video. All of my kids firmly believe, because I told them, that there ha you have to have a driver's license before you can get a phone. <laughs> that seems good. It works. It seems totally it right. Okay. Uh, any more questions? Um... Uh, gentleman in the tie. Hi, my name is Mark. I used to uh, be a staffer at the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and one of the things that uh, that jumped out, uh, we, we got the overnight death reports every you know, morning. Uh, when fun. My, and, and my kids were little at the time that I worked at the CPSC, Day. so uh, so that was fun. But one of the things that, that jumped out was the number of deaths that are associated with water. Uh, and I just, I wonder if you've looked at any reports about supervision around bathtub time or anything mm -hmm. like that. No, it's super question. strange. I actually didn't. That is something that I should have put, I should have put more in because I think exactly as you say, there's a lot of, you know, we, this is a, this is a risk that people do not think about in the same way they think about some risks that are much smaller. Um, so I think, like, for example, you hear all these discussions about the rock and play sleeper and, like, don't put your kid in the rock and play sleeper, you know, the rock and play sleeper. And, like, th not that I think you should put your, necessarily put your kid in the rock and play sleeper, but, like, we have to sort of be clear that the number of deaths associated with that sleep method is extremely small relative to, say, the number of deaths associated with pools. Um, and so I think, but you're, it's actually not covered in the book and it totally should be, so... Great question. Um, we can take another still. Um, so do we have any others? In the middle, in the, in the, middle, middle. In the very back. Sure, okay, lady in the middle. Uh, my name is Yang Lo Yun, Foundation for Empowerment. I'm a uh, development economist, so I have been working on many uh, developing countries, and I was born in the poor, then poorest country. And so uh, I just uh, try to a little bit uh, think, give a question in perspective. Here, everybody is from the very privileged country, and um, but uh, when you are talking about, for example, vaccination, and when I was reading the uh, uh, research paper, th those who appreciate vaccination the most are African countries where I used to work now because vaccination really saves people. So uh, in, I haven't read your book, and I have never had a children, so I feel like I don't have any... Uh, right to ask questions, but in terms of development and the public economics uh, perspective, the uh, vaccination has the uh, public benefit. So not only my child. You know, we know that when there was a measles in California, the many, many children were affected, even in America. So uh, I'd, like to ask, Sorry. I'd like to ask that question. Second, uh, now, we seem to take things so um, granted, for granted. So, and then at the same time, the, the way we bring up children and the, the way children grow up are very different. They used to be a neighborhood. Even economist a couple of months ago was talking about neighborhood. But these days, all parents 
are the best friends or whatever they take care of, not your neighborhood where we used to play together, all these things. They seem to play amazing um, influence on parenting and uh, in some sense anxiety because I'm one of the seven children. My parents never had the time to take care of each of us with the great, great grandparents and great grandparents of everything. So Thank you. I'm wondering how the neighborhood, all this individualism works on this kind of question. Thank you for Thank your you question. Thank you very much. Yeah, so I think on the question of, of vaccination, I mean, part, you know, I, I, I have in my past life been a development economist, and so I, I worked some on vaccination in developing countries, and I actually think the sort of distinction between kind of how do people think about vaccination choices in developing countries versus the U.S. Are, is in, informative, and, and it is in some ways very striking uh, that, you know, we seem to have sort of walked backwards from a place where like people were interested in vaccinating and I think it's not uh, I think it's not an accident in the sense that part of it is like you know people here have never seen measles so they kind of think it's made up and like you know when you and I think part of what ha what has happened you can sort of see these in the in the data is after there is an outbreak of some disease people are like oh my gosh like actually that turns out to be a real disease I should definitely vaccinate my kid for that um, and I think in developing countries that doesn't you know we yeah. see measles all the time and so yeah. like of course, you're going to vaccinate your kid against yeah. measles. Paul, Paul, just really quickly, Paul yeah. Offit, who's mm -hmm. a very famous vaccine researcher, um, he he actually said we didn't just eradicate the diseases; we eradicated the memory of the diseases. Yeah. So, uh, my children have never seen an iron lung. My children have never seen someone with measles. So, anyway, right. go on. Yeah, no. So, I think that. So, I think that's that's a sort of interesting thing on this question of like you know neighborhoods versus individualism, which I think is. I, you know, it's just like super interesting and I do have the sense that like the way that my kids are interacting in the sort of built environment and, and kind of what does their day look like is just totally different from my from my childhood yeah. where I was kind of like out in the, yeah. out, out, we were outside, like in the, in the, but down the street, in the parking lot, I don't know, like throwing balls at each other, who knows what, falling out of trees. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and you know, I, I, I think about is there a way to like have my kids do that, and I I kind of don't see a way because no one else is doing that. Yeah, the 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 world has changed lots. Yeah. In, in the summer, I work from home, so I'm home when my kids are home in the summertime, and my kids will often go out of the house, and there's no kids are home, so they knock on the doors, and no kids are home because they're all at camps, and and it's understandable. Both parents are working, and so the kids from, you know, from the day they get out of school to the day school starts up, they're in nonstop camps, and, you know, around four, they start trickling in, um, but I agree with you. N neighborhoods used to be where there was a parent mostly home, mostly the mom was home, and this created sort of an idea where there was a network looking out for the kids. And so I write a lot about free range parenting. I, I know Cato has hosted Lenore Skenazy, sort of the founder of the free range movement. And I definitely try to free range my children. Um, but it is harder in some ways because there isn't sort of that network. There's some of it, but it's not quite as rigorous and as tight as it used to be. That actually, that reminds me of something Emily was saying backstage about your eight-year-old walking to oh, school. So as long as this has come up, why don't we talk a little bit about this whole free-range uh, parenting idea? Yeah. And yes. What are your thoughts on that? So I mean, what I was saying on the on, on downstairs was that I have um, that my my I live like two blocks from my kids my kids' school, and so last year my. Uh, my daughter was in second grade, wanted to walk home some of the time, like on the days when there is a crossing guard at the one street from our, for, that is across from, that it's like on the way to our, uh, to our house. And, um, and we, you know, like my, I, I was very pro this. My husband was a bit more skeptical. We kind of like worked it, worked it out. Um, we actually had to go and like meet with the school and talk to the school and meet with the teachers and talk about like whether this was something that they were going to think was okay. And they were like very supportive and very nice about it. But it was clear that this was like even having an eight-year-old walk like one block, to one and a half blocks was like really outside, um, outside the norm and and but you know then this this sort of episode happened early on that made me realize why why this was very important for us which is like so she walks down the street and then there's one the crossing guard can see her the whole way until she turns onto our street and then we're like two houses down and one day she came and our neighbor's driveway is between the the corner and our and our house and one day she came and the neighbor's like the painter or something the truck was parked such that in order to get around the truck she would have had to walk in the street she got there and she thought 
as, as she reports it. Like, basically, I am not supposed to walk in the street by have myself. I'm going to at the rest of my and No, no, she didn't. So she thought, I'm going to have to, like, I'm not allowed to go in the street. And so she just turned around, and she went back to the crossing guard, and she said, you know, like, there's this thing blocking it. And, like, like she basically, so but she solved the problem. And then, like, her friend Anna's mom was there, and she, like, took her home and it was, and it was totally fine. But it was like, you know, for, to, I, I feel like that, and on one hand it's like, okay, yeah, your kid, oh, there must be a genius. They were able to walk. But like, but like, I think we're not giving our kids we that. Don't. We're not giving our kids the sort of independence to kind of make those. Or the credit. The, or the credit that like you, you know, she would know what to do as opposed, she wouldn't just like sit there and like wait. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. Like, Build like, a little shelter. Gonna, like, stop live there the rest it. of her life. Yeah. You know, she she actually figured it out, and of course, like of course, she would be able to do well, that. Well, I think I think my, I have some theories on this too. And this again, this is not no data to back this up, but I do think you know you talked about the, like, you know, we tend to make everything kind of like you know women are or, and men are older when they have children, and they try to make everything like they're going to do it the best. And I think in some ways. Um, allowing your child maybe the slight danger, and there's no danger, because my, my eight-year-old was walking home all year. And um, it, it's somehow, that's not being a good parent. I think there's a little bit of that that goes along with it. And so, um, you know, I, I know at, at my kid's school, there are fifth graders who are still picked up by their parents. Um, our elementary school goes to fifth grade. And that's astonishing to me. Um, I couldn't wait to stop going to school pickup. And so um, I think that's a little bit of it. It's, a, it's another sign that you're a superior parent if you're just really involved, really involved. And so the schools, though, um, there was, it was a rule at our school, too, that my second grader couldn't walk home and he had to be picked up by his older brother, which wasn't a problem because he was walking home, too. But I also think about people who we mentioned, you know, people who are at or under the poverty line who yeah. have kids. And I mean, that's a, that's a hassle for them. They may be working a job that doesn't allow them to go to school pickup. And so I think that rule is very unfair. If you have determined as a family that your child can walk home, the two blocks or the quarter mile or whatever it is, um, uh, I think schools should be more flexible on that. That's a great note. We might have time for just one more question from someone preferably who hasn't already asked one, if there's any, if there are any remaining questions. Sure, a, a lady I, with blonde hair in the back. Uh, my name is Ashley, and I'm actually, it was late because I was breastfeeding, uh, my 10-week-old. Um, but I actually had a question for you, uh, Emily. Uh, recently, I just have been dealing with getting a nanny and de uh, debating on whether we do nanny or daycare and all of the other options. And I was talking to one of my friends, actually several friends, um, about the nanny option and if we get a nanny that speaks another language and or if we go with a nanny that only speaks English. And I was wondering if you did any research into uh, whether whether children who have nannies or if they learn two languages, if they retain that language, those language skills. So, I mean, in so in general, uh, you're like if you have someone who is consistently speaking to your kid in another language, they will learn some of that uh, some of that language. Um, they will not retain it unless they you keep doing it. Um, so you know that's but it may be easier for them to learn it later. Um, you know the other thing that people ask often about bilingual stuff is like you know will my kid learn to talk more slowly? And the answer is yes, um, but they will eventually turn to learn to learn to talk. Um, and so I think. You know, there. I, I think what I would say is that it is a commitment. So the sort of like, let me get a Spanish-speaking nanny, like as a kind of like, w like a whim. That probably wouldn't, unless you are really committed to having your kids speak Spanish, and you're going to continue to be committed to that indefinitely. Uh, you know, then like that's great. If you're if you're not, you probably should just pick the best nanny. And if they speak Spanish, like that's great. Um, but if they speak English, that's also probably cool. Um, usually, people who end up who end up truly bilingual. It's because one. It's because of a par like a parent, right? Because if, if a parent is really committed to speaking, uh, to speaking to the kid in only one language, it's but it's actually still really hard to retain. You know, the friend like even the the people that I know who have done this. Like once your kid goes to school, then they just want to speak English. <laughs> want to talk to you in Russian anymore? And uh, <laughs> and you know that's you can yeah they can kind of keep understanding, but they lose some of the some of the vocalization unless you are like you know really enforcing it. Okay, 
So I think uh, that's probably all we have time for in terms of questions if we want nice in-depth answers. So before I thank the speakers, I just want to say please do join us for lunch, which will be held on the second floor. In the lobby, there is a spiral uh, staircase that leads straight up to where lunch is. Restrooms are on the way. Look for the yellow wall for those. Uh, crib sheets, the book will be available for purchase uh, in the hallway. And Emily has very graciously agreed to sign some copies of that book before she leaves. She has to catch uh, a flight, actually. She's going to be back home uh, this evening. So we really appreciate uh, your coming during your very busy schedule. She also had another engagement right before coming here. So she's just been uh, doing things back to back and actually flew out very early this morning to come speak to us. Um, and so if you do hope to get her signature, you may have to hurry since you may not be able to spend that much time signing books. Um, now please join me in thanking our speakers with a round of applause. Thank you.